Hello, my name is Robin Hoyle, Head of Learning Innovation here at Huswait International. This is the third part in a series of four mini presentations which collectively make up the presentation that I gave in my keynote speech at the World of Learning Conference in October 2017. In part one we talked about what we mean by learning and in part two we talked about how change happens because it seems to me that implicit to any learning process is the idea that something will change afterwards. And in part three we're going to talk a little bit about well what does change and we hope that what changes is performance that we enable people to do things differently and do different things back in the workplace in such a way that their performance improves, that they become more productive, more capable, more able to do things, to do things a little bit easier, to do things that where they are working smarter rather than harder. So how do we get better results from our individuals is the subject of this particular uh, session. And at Husweight International we've been working with the idea of performance journeys for a little while now and the basic starting point for those performance journeys mirrors to a certain extent some of the ideas that I talked about in part two, the change equation, where we were talking about having a clear goal, a vision for where we're going to get to. And when we're talking about individual performance that vision needs to be very personal. It needs to be about what the individual is going to be able to do differently and why they would want to do that differently and at what level they would want to be able to perform. I've suggested that that target setting process might involve a second person that I've called, in inverted commas, a coach. Of course it might not be a coach, might not certainly have that title, and I sometimes think that this is the bread and butter role of a line manager to support people to improve their capability at the point of work. And it would seem to me that giving it another title to suggest that somehow this is an extra job is not helpful. Certainly we've found quite a lot of resistance when we've asked people to coach, when in actual fact what we really want them to do is to do part of their normal day-to-day -day role, but just do it in a slightly different way. So once that target setting has happened, we then have an agenda which we need to meet, and we might want to give people some information to help them to meet that agenda, to contextualise that learning. So that might be about the know why, why am I doing this, and it will definitely be the know what, where we talk about maybe theories, models, concepts, ideas, where people have already come up with ways of doing these things better and it helps us to learn from their experience and from the research which has been undertaken. Certainly at Huthwaite that's where we would position our uh, research methodologies that, that have given us all sorts of models and theories which we know work because we've measured them over the last four decades. So the know what is predefined to a certain extent. We want people to do things in a particular way because we know that that way works, not just because we think we know best. So we're asking people to do things in the way that we would recommend them, which our research shows is the best way of doing it, but of course it's not just about knowledge and it's not just about understanding the rationale behind having that knowledge, it's also about skills. And that's the know-how component. It's about being able to apply those models, apply those concepts, apply those theories in the real world, in the day-to-day -day work that people undertake. And that know-how process seems to me to be a point where you might want to go to the extra expense of bringing people together, where it might be the most efficient and effective way of getting individuals in front of an expert, somebody who knows what good looks like and can provide advice and can facilitate and provide feedback and enable people to learn as they do, uh, that we might want to get people together in a classroom with their peers as well so that they can also learn from other people's experiences as well as learning from their own lived experience during the course. At the end of that workshop and event we need to make sure first of all that everybody can use the skills but also we need to make sure that they have a clear plan of action for what happens next because there is no point completing a set of learning interventions some of which will be quite expensive to organize in terms of taking people away from their day job and putting them into some sort of training facility if we're then not going to make sure that people do something differently when they go back into the workplace and that do process is really important we should recognize and accept that participants should be held to account for completing their action plan. But of course we shouldn't just leave them alone at that point, we might want to give them some help. We might want to help them to reflect, we might want to give them some refreshers of the key knowledge elements, we might want to give them some job aids, some performance support tools, we might want to help them to reflect by 
creating logs and sharing their stories, but fundamentally we want them to be involved in continually honing those skills through practice back in the workplace. And you'll see along the bottom there that we are moving steadily from formal learning, the bit which is typically mandated and organised by the by the organisation themselves, through to an informal learning process where the individual is very much in control. They learn at the pace which is appropriate to them, and they learn on the activities which are specific to their role, their function, their, their department within the business. So we need to support that, and I would anticipate that the coach or line manager is actively engaged in that process, both in the participant accountability stage, but also in making sure that people do reflect that they do use the appropriate tools and refreshers to reinforce and underline and embed the skills that we've talked about within the previous stages of the journey. And no performance journey would really be complete unless we had some mechanism for measuring whether it worked. Now we might come up with all sorts of fancy bar graphs and dashboards and we give people lots of data that they can look at. The problem with those kinds of tools is that, let's be honest, nobody reads them very often, looks at them, and if they do they don't necessarily understand what the data is telling them. So we need to simplify that measurement process to something which actually means something to the people who are involved. And there are three stages to that measurement piece. The first is quite simply, do people have the skills? Can they do what is required? We will be very remiss if people left the classroom not being able to demonstrate some capability which would enable them to go and practice back in the workplace. So when we've got those input sessions, we need to make sure people can use the skills that they have. But then when they get back into the workplace, it becomes an issue of do they do what is required? Are they applying these skills to the day-to-day -day work or have they very quickly slipped back into doing things the way that they used to do in the past? And very often that process is missing. When we look at what organisations are measuring, they're measuring the ability of people immediately after a classroom event, but they're not looking at what people do with those skills. So it's very important that we hold people to account for utilising the skills that they have been sent to, de to deliver and develop. And of course, once we've got those skills being used, we can then have a look at whether or not it works do we get the results that we would expect? And of course, in some circumstances, those results will be relatively apparent. They'll be easy to measure. It will generate a whole series of numbers that we can look at and say, yes, performance has improved or performance has stayed the same or even gone down slightly. But we know that we can look at those numbers. It gives us an indicator of whether or not we're on the right tracks. But that's not always the case. And sometimes we latch onto a series of numbers which are relatively meaningless in the overall scope of things, but where we do have an opportunity to measure a hard number so we feel good about it. I must urge people to be very careful that they measure the things which are really, really important rather than just the things which generate nice easy numbers. Sometimes the numbers tell only part of the picture and it's important that we get the whole performance looked at and the human dimensions within there. And those human dimensions very often come about from gathering stories from people, listening into their own reflections. And reflection is something which people seem to not like doing very often and they find it very difficult. And that's sometimes because we've overcomplicated reflection as well. We've not necessarily given people an easy mechanism to think about what they've done what the implications are and what they might do differently as a result of that. And the Rolf model is one that I think is very straightforward. Rolf was a nurse educator. He was working specifically with people in accident and emergency wards and he was looking at both good outcomes for patients and perhaps less than optimal outcomes for patients or even less than optimal outcomes for the entire department and trying to analyse the learning that had been gained by those people who were involved. And he came up with three very simple questions and those are these. So the first question is what? What happened? Describe the event. Describe what individuals did in response to that event and then move on to, and what are the implications for that? What did we learn? What worked? What didn't work? The so what component. Now once we've got those lessons kind of clearly identified and clearly notified, then we can move into the what next stage. In other words, how will this affect our behaviour in the future? What will we do differently as a result 
of this experience. And that reflection piece is really, really important. It is the, the absolute lifeblood of learning experiences for people. Learning from their own experiences, learning from mistakes, yes, but also learning from their successes. Being able to not only say things went well, but understand why they went well and how this will inform their behaviours in the future. In the next part I'm going to be talking again about the components of a learning environment and what those four components need to be and how we can start to think about that creation of an environment which supports and nurtures individuals to fulfill their potential and to build their capability at a strategic level. I hope you found this useful and I hope you'll have a look at session four. Thank you.